All right. Thank you very much, Mo. Uh, thank you all for being here. I've really enjoyed uh, this uh, series so far, and I'm excited to get to tell you some of what uh, we're doing in my group uh, and uh, see how it connects to stuff that you're doing. Uh, so uh, I'm Zeb Rockman. This is work done in the physics department at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And I'm going to be focusing in particular on what happens when you look at how systems are able to uh, bear external loads when they contain not just rigid rod-like elements, uh, but also uh, cable-like elements, and how that uh, modifies the fundamental physics of such systems. Uh, so this is work done with uh, some very talented uh, folks. Um, so the first two authors uh, were Will Stevenson and Vishal Sadakar, who are both undergrads at Georgia Tech. Will's going on to uh, Michigan for grad school. Vishal is staying here. James McInerney was a grad student here, uh, now at Michigan as a postdoc, and Mike Joukowsky is my former uh, postdoc here. Uh, let me just hide the meeting controls there for me. Okay, good. And the work was funded in part uh, by an ARO Murray Award. Uh, all right. Okay. So if we think about conventional architecture, it's um, something that is built around compression. So if we have a brick wall, the bricks are under compression. But if we have something that is in some ways a little more interesting, like a tent, some elements are under compression, but also some elements are under extension. They're under tension and they're stretched beyond their equilibrium lengths. Uh, and why is that important? It's important because we can do lots of things with uh, tension elements that we can't do with um, compressive elements. Uh, so if we look at the cables here as compared to the rods, they have low bulk and low weight, and yet they're still strong. If we think about how tension forces have to balance they're supporting uh, on the order of the same tension as the rods while uh, using up a lot less space. Uh, it also gives us flexibility that makes us makes it robust. So NASA likes these structures uh, because you can slam them into a planet surface and still protect the payload. And you also get something that biology takes advantage of, which is a pre-stress programmability. So if I have something then like this a cable I'm holding up on my screen here, uh, it has a load, the pen cap, and how it supports the load depends on how much uh, tension I put in to begin with. Um, so biology, and, and I'm, I'm not really a biophysicist, I'm a sophomore under physicist with, with an interest in uh, biology. Uh, biology has figured out that tensegrities do have these incredible uses. In a sense, given the fact that they can support these uh, tension forces much more efficiently than uh, compressive elements can, uh, biology doesn't have any choice but to use them. So this extends to, uh, for example, our uh, musculoskeletal systems where the, the muscles uh, uh, are acting like the cables, uh, all the way down to the cytoskeleton system, like Guillaume uh, mentioned, uh, where again, you have these sort of uh, membrane structures where you have elements that can support uh, tension, but not uh, compression. And the problem that biology has as compared to something like we saw on the previous slide is that given that we don't have a sort of central designer, and given that we're going to have a lot of randomness, uh, how what happens when we start throwing a lot of rods and cables together at random? How do we get something that hopefully is able to support external stresses, uh, but also has a degree of flexibility, which is, of course, what we want in our bodies to have strength and flexibility. Um, so as a philosophical note, I want to emphasize that uh, often when one's doing simulations, one tries to do a full-scale simulation that captures as many elements of a realistic system as possible. That is the opposite of what I'm trying to do now. So, so I, I'm listening to the maxim that uh, is attributed to Einstein, though other people said similar things, uh, saying that if you want something mathematically precise, you have to accept that it's not necessarily going to describe all of messy reality. So what we're looking for is a minimal mathematical model that captures key elements and is solvable, even if it is not realistic. Um, and what we hope to gain from that is qualitative insights about real systems that have tensegrities in them, and that include randomness. Uh, so we can't use something like uh, block waves that have large numbers, so we can get to a scaling limit and hopefully see some phase transitions, and that have nonlinearities. So that's our goal. And to talk about how we do that and why it's hard, I want to think about the difference between a rod and a cable. So if I take uh, two particles and connect them with a rod, then I say the distance between them has to be the length of the rod. So this particle is restricted uh, to this disk. And if I think about linear motions, it's restricted to a little tangent plane here. In contrast, with a cable that's allowed to collapse 
then the position of one particle relative to the other particle is no longer a ring, but it's now the solid disk. So if I think about the movement that it can undergo, it can go left to right, but it can also go inward, but it's not allowed to go outward. And we express that, of course, with an inequality. And that right there should give you some notion of why this has become a harder problem. And it's become a harder problem because when we do math, math is almost synonymous with equations, but we no longer have equations. We have a system now of many random inequalities that we're going to try to master. Um, other people have uh, looked at this before. Um, so the, the uh, study that I draw a lot of inspiration from is Jacobs and Thorpe starting in the 1990s came up with this algorithm called the Pebble Game to tell us uh, how many zero modes, how many floppy modes were present in a depleted triangular lattice. Um, and they were not the first to look at such lattices, nor are they the last, but this was a major advance because the Pebble Game was so much more mathematically efficient that they were able to look at much larger systems and uh, probe the scaling limit. And this might look familiar to those of you who've been attending the series regularly. Uh, Jonathan Michael gave a talk about his uh, work with uh, Momita Das, um, looking at their own work on depleted, uh, I think it was Kagame lattices, actually. Um, there have been lots of other works in this area. So you can look at more complicated structures as uh, Mahadevan has, um, like origami, looking at random origami structures. Uh, this will be coming back to this is Voter Ellenbrook and uh, Zhaoming Mao's. Uh, look at a particular type of system and how it gains and loses rigidity uh, where they used a graph theory. And then this one is important for our purposes because it's the only one I'm aware of where people uh, did an analytic study of what happened when you had a depleted uh, lattice that did have cables. And the one thing that's a little disappointing about this study, which was by the, the great uh, Bob Connolly, uh, is that the result is that if you deplete it at all, it's no longer rigid. That, that if you have a system purely of cables without any rods in the interior, uh, then it's never able to support external stresses. So uh, this th this is our big picture here then. There we go, okay, finally got rid of those. Um, so our sort of big questions are, if we do have a random system where we just start throwing down elements, uh, but they have cables as well as rods, what are the key parameters that control rigidity? So going back to uh, J.C. Maxwell in the 1860s, uh, he knew, that if you added a constraint, it would remove a degree of freedom, that, that it would remove a floppy mode, and that essentially then one could simply do uh, counting. And the question is, is there some counting argument when we have cables as well as rods? Do cables count the same as rods? Do we ignore them entirely? Do they count as half a rod? Or is there going to be something even more complicated that emerges? And then finally, I'm curious again about the nature of the rigidity. So if I think of how many constraints that we throw down and we look at rigidity, then we know it's going to be completely floppy if we don't have very many constraints. And it should be completely rigid if we had enough constraints. But do we get sort of a smooth crossover, which for physicists is the boring answer, or do we get a sharp phase transition? So to study that question, I take the simplest element I can. So this is a simple four bar linkage or a plaquette. Um, and it has a shearing mode. So the rule is that these are rods, so I can't change their length, but I can change the angles between them. So it can shear to the left or shear to the right. Now, if I add a rigid rod connecting here, and actually I've added two, it doesn't really matter if I add two or one, suddenly it's rigid. I cannot shear it to the left or to the right without costing energy with it tensioning or even breaking the rods. And then a cable, hopefully you can picture this, it does something in between. The cable, I'm still allowed to shear to the left because the cable will just crumple, but shearing to the right, uh, that costs tension energy here. And if we start taking these simple squares and sticking them together, what we start to get is column and row modes. So if I think about how I shear these, but I want to remain in the two-dimensional plane, this is a two-dimensional study, um, then the only way to deform these is to shear a whole column or a whole row all at the same time. Um, but we can do both. We can say, I'm going to shear some columns by some amount and some rows by some amount. And consequently, what we have then is if I want to know how much I have sheared a particular plaquette, it is equal to the amount by which I've sheared its whole row minus the amount by which I've sheared its whole column. The fact that it's minus instead of plus is just a sign convention. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a structure like this, except larger, and we're going to start adding in a bunch of cables and rods at random. And we're going to try to count how many zero modes remain, which, which is something that is not obvious how we would do that a priori. 
Um, and we have this problem that if I add three cables, I actually haven't eliminated any zero modes. I've eliminated some configurations. There are some configurations that I could draw, but if I, before I start, I have a four dimensional space of floppy modes. And after I've added three cables, I still have a four dimensional space of floppy modes. So I can choose to share this one, share this one, share this one, and then share this one. Um, that, that four dimensional space includes a rotation mode, I should say. But if I add a fourth cable, suddenly the whole thing snaps together and becomes rigid. Now, because of the geometry of how these cables are oriented, I could have oriented them in opposite directions, and this would no longer be true. But because of how they're oriented here, there's no way to shear the thing at all. So what's going on? What's going on is something that can be captured by a graph theory. So what we do is we take each column shear mode and each row shear mode, and we draw them as nodes in a graph. And this is a bipartite graph, so I use filled nodes and open nodes for the columns and the rows. And what I'm going to do is if I have a cable in a plaquette that connects a column mode and a row mode, then I'm going to draw an arrow here. And this arrow, this uh, directed edge in the graph theory, is just a graphical shorthand for saying this mode has to have a greater amplitude than this mode in order for the cable not to stretch. So with three cables, I have something like this. That just tells me this has to be greater than this, greater than this, greater than this. And what happens when I add the fourth cable is suddenly I have a closed cycle. So now I know that all these modes have to be greater than each other and greater than or equal to each other, more precisely, and less than or equal to each other. And the only way they can have that is if they all have the same amplitude, which means that I only have one mode here, which in fact is, is not even a floppy mode. It's a rotation mode of the whole thing. So this is the key idea here that makes our analysis work, um, which is that if I have my complicated structure with many rows and many columns, and I start throwing down cables and rods at random to represent random additional constraints, I can generate my whole cluster, uh, excuse me, my whole graph. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna count the clusters. So a cluster is a set of nodes that I can reach from one another, keeping in mind that these directed edges only allow me to go in one direction. But because I can have closed cycles, it's possible for me to have a set of nodes that are all reachable from one another. And what they represent then is a single floppy mode. So directed edges are cables, undirected edges are rods, and the green colored nodes are all part of one giant cluster. The other nodes are independent. And once I have this approach, then I have two very powerful techniques that become available to us. One is that I can just ask the computer, to count clusters. And if you think about the size of systems that you can uh, simulate, um, they're, they're gonna be smaller than this um, because we can simulate systems that have uh, tens of thousands of nodes, which would correspond to uh, systems with uh, hundreds of millions of degrees of freedom. If I think of each vertex as displacing in the plane independently. So of course we're not simulating all those degrees of freedom, but the graph theory that we do simulate corresponds to uh, that system. And then the other advantage we have is that we have a self-consistent mean field theory that, that's based very closely on what uh, people have looked at in the literature before. So, uh oh, okay, uh, so whoop, there we go. So we have this, uh, and somehow I brought back the floating meeting controls. Um, uh, okay, so what we have here is that what we see is that there's a key parameter which is the coordination number. And this is the number of edges that emerges from each node. And that should be familiar to you uh, if you remember the disease models that people are looking at at the beginning of COVID, where they said, okay, if one person infects two, infects four, we're gonna have a big cluster of infections. Whereas if one person infects one half, infects one fourth, uh, we're gonna have this small isolated cluster. So to have a giant cluster uh, that are all part of the same floppy mode, uh, we need for their to be a coordination number above one. And what that tells us is that there is a key parameter that determines rigidity, which is in fact the number of rods plus one half the number of cables. So this indicates as we might've hypothesized that each cable contributes half as much as each rod to the constraints of the system. Uh, and there's something else that's going on here. Uh, and what's going on here is that uh, the transition, the rate at which the size of the rigid area grows uh, is going like the delta C to the first power for a system of all rods. For a system of all cables, it goes like delta C to the second power, so significantly softer. And you might say, oh, I don't need to worry about cables because if I mix a rod and cables, it's mostly rods. It's probably going to look like rods. 
it turns out that you can't get away with that analysis because any system that has any number of cables uh, in the large system size limit is actually going to scale like the system that has all additional cables added. So even a few cables is enough to fundamentally modify the nature of the transition here. And this is speculative, but it's something that I wonder about both in the context of biology and, and in engineered systems. There's, there's some evidence, I'm not an expert, that uh, the nervous system is at a critical point because it needs to be in order to respond to signals that occur over different ranges of length scales and amplitudes. And the mechanical system is also hierarchical. It also uh, could be critical in the sense of needing to be able to respond to mechanical signals at uh, many different scales. And what this is saying is that by incorporating cable-like elements, we actually have a wider uh, critical point where we go away from the critical point more slowly. And I'm speculating, but perhaps, uh, perhaps biological systems have figured this out and are using cables uh, to maintain this uh, critical point more easily than if they only had rigid elements. So moving on to another question, even when we have uh, systems that are um, that have collective rigidity, what we would have then is we would have a big part of the system was rigid, but it doesn't necessarily stretch across the whole system. So even once we've gone through the rigidity transition that I showed you on the previous slide, uh, we still do not have a rigid system. What we could have instead is we could have one rigid part, another rigid part, but if I pull on the two sides, because we have that one column left over, uh, it's possible that uh, the system will not support an external stress. So we have a separate uh, rigidity transition, which is the one that uh, uh, Alan Broke and Mao looked at in a system that did not have any cables. So this, this is essentially their, their result right here. How do we go from having uh, just one or two columns left over to having a system that is fully rigid? Um, it, this is again something that is analytically tractable. So as on the previous slide, I, I don't know if this was even obvious, but the previous slide, uh, we did have a situation here where we have the theory lines, the dashed lines, and then the uh, simulation data, and they just line up so well. The system is very mean field uh, that you can't even really see the difference. Similar situation here, uh, and we see that C is still the key parameter, which means a cable still counts for half as much as a rod, but we need logarithmically more uh, constraints in order to achieve full rigidity. And the reason is just that as we keep adding constraints, they tend to hit the regions that are already rigid. So it takes a while to uh, hit that last uh, column. Um, that still doesn't mean that we need a large fraction of the squares filled though, because what we need is logarithmically many uh, constraints added to something that is growing linearly. So in the large system size limit, we still achieve full rigidity even when the system does not have uh, most uh, placats with, with a cable or a rod. And a, a key observation here is that if we compare the situation in which there are no cables to the situation in which there's all cables or there's a mixture of rods and cables, then what we have is once again, systems that have a mixture of rods and cables behave essentially exactly like systems that have only cables added in. Uh, and it's the system that has uh, all rods that is, again, the odd person out. Uh, so once again, the addition of any amount of cables is enough to strongly modify uh, the behavior of this full rigidity transition. So just, just to emphasize here, this is where we have collective rigidity emerge at all, where we start to have uh, large regions of the system that are rigid. This is where the system is 100% rigid. In both cases, cables count as half a rod for determining the uh, nature of the transition. And we have that uh, cables, the addition of cables is enough to uh, qualitatively soften the transition. So we come now to another phenomenon that is not just qualitatively different in the case with cables, but is only apparent at all in the case with cables. So once again, going back to Maxwell, it's been known that if you add a constraint, you either eliminate the zero mode or you don't. So if I have a system that's already got a rigid region, and I add a rigid constraint to the rigid region, I don't eliminate the zero mode at all. I generate what's called the state of self-stress instead. Um, but even in my simple example here, what we saw was that for cables, these three cables aren't enough to eliminate any zero modes. But once I add in this uh, fourth cable, it eliminates multiple zero modes all at once. 
So that is something that in a sense, the cables are actually more powerful than the rods because a single cable can eliminate uh, multiple zero modes at once, whereas a system of all rods, each additional rod can eliminate um, at most uh, one zero mode. So here's an example of what that looks like in practice is that we have this cluster of seven nodes in our graph three that are downstream from the giant cluster. And then if we add one more cable, they become downstream and upstream from the giant cluster, which means they join the giant cluster. So here, a white node is floppy, a green node is rigid, and the pink nodes are the nodes that become rigid with the addition of this one additional cable. So we see floppy regions and rigid regions, and we see the dynamics of how uh, new regions join the cluster here. One thing I note is the rigid region is somehow all spread out here. That's a bit artificial. That comes from the fact that we have straight lines of bonds that propagate tension all across the system uh, with no length scale associated with them. And that's why we can sort of uh, skip columns without the system uh, noticing that. In any event, it's easy in the simulation to uh, count avalanche statistics, say how many times you have an avalanche of size one, of size two, of size three. In the mean field theory, it's somewhat harder, but we did come up with a way uh, that, that I'll refer you to the uh, paper to go through the details of, um, of generating a recursion relationship that still allows us to calculate the probabilities of avalanches of different sizes. So avalanches of size more than one are less likely, and they're more uh, relying on being at the critical point. So an avalanche of size two, the yellow stuff here, or three, green stuff, it's getting closer and closer to the critical point so it really is a phenomenon associated being close to the critical point of having a significant number of avalanches of large size where you have a large number of clusters joining at once, which means multiple columns and multiple rows all being brought into the giant cluster at the same time. So um, we, we are interested in taking this model system that I've shown you that's given us some insights already, and we're working to extend it. So Vishal's paper is going to focus on systems that are slightly more realistic physically in the sense that at least they don't have uh, straight lines. And we have some preliminary results here. So we have uh, a system that still has a backbone that has the topology of a regular Cartesian grid, uh, but that no longer has straight lines. And that complicates things considerably because we no longer have column modes and we no longer have row modes. As far as I know, there's not a graph theoretic description of this, um, but we're able to use uh, some other mathematical techniques to capture systems of varying sizes. So, so when I talked about one of these with uh, Shlomo Gortler, at, um, uh, he said that, oh yes, the, this technique can handle systems of, of any size you want, as big as you could want. I'm like, well, how, how big is that? He said, well, you know, like 10 or 15 degrees of freedom. It's like, oh, I really want larger than that. So we're still working on getting to larger systems, but for this little four by four system, we have a technique that we think works well that tells us the probability that rigidity forms. And what we see from this is that our sort of hypothesis that we've developed from the uh, regular systems that I showed you earlier uh, seems to hold. Namely, that if I look at how much a cable contributes, cables count half as much as a rod. One way to see that is based on the slope of these ISO contours here, where the probability of rigidity is the same as I trade off rods and cables. I can see that more quantitatively if I take the uh, discrete derivative based on the data of the probability of rigidity as I change the number of rods and number of cables. And this dashed line is not a fit. This is the theory line with slope one half. And we see we get good agreement with the theory line with no free parameters. Uh, and then if we do plot that, if we plot the generic rigidity as a function of the number of rods plus one half the number of cables, we see that this fits in a sense even better than we'd have a reason to expect it to, where the Maxwell point is at seven here. And indeed, seven is very close to when the probability of rigidity is just at uh, one half. So we have this good agreement here. We're looking to continue onward. Um, but what we see is that a system of random rods and cables undergoes a rigidity phase transition. In fact, it undergoes two, one in which we see this rigid area fraction emerging and one in which we achieve total rigidity and are able to support stress from one side to the other. Um, and what we've seen is that we have this key parameter that really modifies the uh, Maxwell point where we should count cables as one half the number of rods. 
And I think that raises a lot of interesting questions because there's there are systems like jam packings that in a sense have one-way interactions where they resist compression but not extension. And yet somehow they still occur at the conventional Maxwell point. So there's something to be understood about why they still occur at the conventional Maxwell point where this new result indicates that the uh, half constraints would, would not be enough to rigidify the system. And we're working on modifying those to generic systems. It would be lovely to go to 3D. I don't know if we'll ever get there. It would be lovely to look at uh, if someone is working strategically to try to achieve a certain uh, type of rigidity by putting in correlations. So it's something we're looking to continue on with and something where we're looking to make more contact with the uh, biophysics community. Uh, and I think I am uh, into question time here, so I will uh, stop and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Zeph, for a wonderful talk. Uh, I'll clap on behalf of everybody. So once again, uh, you know, uh, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself and, and ask your question. So. All right, so I guess I can get started with, with uh, you know, and you already alluded to going to 3D, et cetera. So I was wondering how dependent are your results on, you know, the topology of your network or are the dimensionality, those kinds of things? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so so we know that they are quite dependent and this, this is based in part on work that uh, we and other people have done on systems that don't have any cables. Um, they're quite dependent on the geometry. So straight lines versus generic uh, lattices do acquire and lose rigidity in very different ways. For one thing, when you have generic lattices uh, with open boundary conditions, the floppiness stays on the boundary. That, that's gonna be floppier than the bulk, whereas these systems don't even really know that they have a boundary. So, so the geometry matters quite a bit. And one of the things we are working to do is to modify the topology to something that is more generic and go to a depleted triangular lattice. Um, and the expectation is that that is going to modify things uh, substantially. And the, the part that I feel confident about is I do think we're still going to see a rigidity transition at this new point that we've identified where we count cables as half a rod. And I think we are still going to see it as, as an actual phase transition rather than a gradual crossover. And that's, that's a prediction. That's not a result we have. But I, I feel just from getting a feel for these systems, that is a takeaway that I feel pretty confident in. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? Okay. I might ask another question while we wait. So uh, so in terms of, you know, uh, ap applying things to, uh, you know, biological systems, et cetera. So biological, you know, if you think of fibers, which have rope-like structure, they're often hierarchical. Yes. Right? And I feel like that's something that you have again alluded to a little bit in your talk, right? Building in yeah. some hierarchy, hierarchical structure in, in your, yeah. uh, you know, in your model. And any any insights or any thoughts on how that might, you know, uh, play out? Yeah. So so we, we don't have immediate plans to incorporate um, sort of underlying hierarchy to this. So so I know that uh, Jonathan Michael, um, when he was here with Peter Yonker, and I think when he was working with you, has explicitly added in hierarchy where he has sort of, you know, the Kagame lattice, and then he has the triangular lattice in the Kagame lattice. So that it has different topologies at different scales. Um, so, so we could try that, but I'm not uh, thinking of adding that so much. What, what's interesting to me though, is that when you're at a phase transition, you sort of get hierarchy for free. Mm -hmm. That at a phase transition, what we would expect to see is we would see clusters of rigid rigidity emerging at all length scales without having to program that in explicitly. And that that's the thing that I'm more interested in looking at is seeing if without telling the system to program in hierarchy, just choosing to be at the phase transition point, if that's enough to get us the advantages of hierarchy. Right, and the avalanches that you mentioned could be one way of seeing some of those kinds of things, right, so. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so. What I'm going to do now is, uh, you know, stop recording and we'll take more questions for both you, Zeb, and as well as Guillaume in the next 10, 15 minutes. Once again, Zeb, thank you very much for this wonderful talk and I will clap on behalf of everybody.